Every Sunday, we take time to remember what our Lord has done for us through the communion, the Lord's Supper. To prepare for this time, we're going to look briefly into God's Word. And if you don't have a Bible, uh, we have some men who are going to come down the aisle, and uh, if you just raise your hand, they'll make sure that you get a copy of it. If you don't own a Bible, uh, you're welcome to keep it as our gift to you. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll look just briefly at verses 1 to 9. You know, the Apostle Paul who wrote this book of Ephesians was perhaps the most influential leader in the early church. He had a crucial role in the spreading of the gospel among the Gentiles in the first century. He established more than a dozen churches throughout the Roman Empire. And he authored more letters than any other New Testament writer. But yet he wrote this of himself in 1 Timothy 1.15. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Paul saw himself as the first, the leading, the chief, the highest ranking of sinners. He saw himself as the world's worst sinner. In Ephesians 3.8, he describes himself as the very least of all the saints. In 1 Corinthians 15.9, he says that, He saw himself as the least of the apostles and not even worthy to be called one. You know, there are probably many counselors, psychologists, therapists today who would say, Paul has a very poor self-image. He really needs to work on improving his self-esteem. But yet there's nothing wrong with Paul's evaluation of himself. He has a healthy, realistic, and accurate assessment of himself. Now, how did Paul come to this kind of evaluation about his own life? Why does he see himself as the chief of all sinners, the least of all believers, one who's not even qualified to be an apostle? Well, I believe he came to this conclusion about himself through the work of the Holy Spirit in his life at the moment of his salvation. He finally understood that he was a sinner, that he was under the wrath of God, but yet God in his grace reached out and saved him. And from that moment, Paul never lost sight of how unworthy he was of God's grace. You know, when Paul wrote his letter to the believers in the church at Ephesus, he exhorted them to live in a manner worthy of God's calling in your life, of your salvation. In chapter two, he reminds them that they're saved by grace alone, apart from any human effort or work or merit. Look at verses one to three. Paul first says, you're spiritually dead. You are dead in your trespasses and sins. See, prior to our salvation, we as believers are spiritually dead. We don't have a relationship with God. We're separated from God because of our sin and under his judgment. We are unable to communicate with God. We're unable to fellowship with God. We're unable to obey God. We're unable to please God. And then secondly, he reminds him, you were enslaved to sin. Look at verses two and three in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of the flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. See, prior to salvation, we as believers were living in sin. We're slaves to sin. We're in bondage to sin. We have no choice but to sin and to live in disobedience to God. We're living according to the standard and the values of this world of which Satan has dominion. We're living in rebellion and opposition to God. 
we're living only to fulfill and indulge our sinful and fleshly desires. And then Paul thirdly reminds them at the end of verse three, you are under the wrath of God. And we're by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So prior to salvation, we as believers are the objects of God's wrath. Because God is absolutely holy, we're under his judgment for our sin. We are children of wrath, like, just like the rest of humanity. You see, Paul in these verses is describing the spiritual condition of every human being in the world. And he's reminding the believers in Ephesus, this is the way you were before God saved you. Now, the very next two words in verse four are the most important and amazing words in this chapter. But God. Now, some of our English translations begins because of his great love for us. But I believe these translations miss really the emphasis that Paul is making. The New Testament word here is literally translated, but God. This is really what the gospel is. Paul is emphasizing, in spite of our spiritual condition, even when we were hopeless and helpless, it was God who took the initiative to reach out to us. It was God who sovereignly intervened and extended his grace to us. Paul wrote in Romans 5, 6, for while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for us. We had absolutely nothing to do with it. It wasn't because we somehow deserved it. It wasn't because of any good or merit within us. He chose to extend his grace towards us purely out of his sovereign grace and good pleasure. Salvation is entirely the work of God, of a sovereign God. Now, what did God do to provide the salvation for us? Even while we were dead in a sin, in bondage under God's wrath, God in his mercy and grace reconciled us to himself. He sent his son into the world to die in order to pay for the penalty of all the sins of those who believe in him. He took the penalty that we deserve. He was our substitute. And anyone who believes, places their trust in Jesus Christ alone, are forgiven of their sins. They're justified, declared righteous before God, and given new life in Christ. Now, Paul, in verse 5 and 6, emphasizes what God did for us. He said, number one, he made us alive together with Christ. Number two, he raised us up together with Christ. And number three, he seated us with God in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You see, we're completely identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. When Christ died, we died. When he was buried, we were buried. When he was resurrected, we were resurrected with him and seated with him in heaven. Now, why did God do all these things for us? Why did he extend his saving grace to us? Notice verse, uh, in, in verse 8. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. He did all these things so that purpose he can display, demonstrate throughout all eternity his marvelous grace towards us so that we can know, so that we can marvel, so that we can glorify him for his grace. You know, so often we have a very man-centered theology. We think that salvation is for, simply for our benefit, so that we can have eternal life, so that we could be with our Savior, so that we can enjoy heaven. Salvation is ultimately for the glory of God. Well, Paul had this healthy, accurate, realistic view of himself. And I believe this should be our assessment of our lives as believers. 
You know, there's a tendency for us as believers, I include myself, to see ourselves as not being that bad, that we think that we're better than others in the world. However, if we truly understand the way that we were before our salvation, that we, don't, that we deserve only God's wrath, that we're unworthy of his grace, we'll see that we're no better than anyone else. Remembering who we are and God's grace in our life only produces humility in our life, never pride. That's why Paul said in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. As we come to the Lord's table, we need to come remembering who we are before we were saved and how unworthy we are of his grace. We need to remember that Jesus, what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for us. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. so as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The bread and the cup are visual reminders to us of, of Christ being crucified on the cross and giving his life blood to pay for the penalty of our sin. And every time we eat of these elements, we are proclaiming the Lord's death. We're affirming in our heart once again, he died for me. The reason I'm saved is because of what he did. Every time we eat the elements, we're proclaiming to others around us that our salvation is based on God's grace alone. The Lord's Supper is a unique way that Jesus Christ had established for those who are believers. If you're here this morning, if you trusted Christ, we invite you to join us in our time of remembering him. However, if you've never trusted Christ for your salvation, we're glad that you're here this morning. However, we want you to understand the Lord's table is not intended for you. You can't proclaim his death if you haven't trusted him or believe in him. So as a tray comes to you, please pass it on to the next person. And let me encourage you, if you have any questions or if you'd like to know more about what it means to believe in Christ, ask one of the elders of the church or the person that invited you to um, your questions. Now, if you trusted in Christ as your savior, we're instructed in God's word to examine ourselves, to make sure that we're participating in the Lord's Supper in a manner worthy of our salvation. So we need to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us any sins in our life, to confess it to him before we partake in the communion. So please take a moment, examine your own hearts before the Lord, and when your heart is ready, please eat the bread and drink the cup on your own. <laughs>